I was asked to talk about something of um, relevance to primary care practice, so I thought the obvious thing to talk about mainly today would be the SHARP project, which stands for Self-Help Access in Routine Primary Care, which was um, work that started in the uh, Wakefield locality um, over, uh, over 10 years ago, and we developed a website and various self-help leaflets and resources um, and a training programme, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, but first of all, I'll give a bit of context. Um, so what I'm talking about is self-help or self-management support within primary care for common mental health problems. And by common mental health problems, I mean mainly anxiety and depression. Um, I think the case for self-management support is particularly strong for depression, as you might know, because not only is depression the um, second leading cause of disability worldwide, but it is known to be a problem that tends to reoccur for a lot of people. So it's not a case of you know, you have an episode of depression, you have treatment, and then you're fine. For a lot of people, even after they recover from a psychotherapeutic intervention, something like 50% of people will relapse within two years. And I was involved in a study recently within the, um, one of the local Improve and Access to Psychological Therapy Services, IAP services, where we followed up people who had received one of the low-intensity interventions, so... I think most of you will know what I mean by that. That's, that, that's one of the interventions such as guided self-help or stress control classes that are provided by psychological well-being practitioners, which tends to be the first step in terms of treatment within IAP services. And we, what we did is to follow those people up after they'd recovered. So this was people who'd actually recovered on the IAP definition of recovery to see how they did in the subsequent uh, years, in fact, two years. And I'll show you the... Um, a bit more information on that on the next slide, but, but we found that 50% of people um, who, had, who had successfully um, recovered from a uh, low-intensity intervention relapsed within a year. Um, so for some people, depression is um, a recurring problem or a long-term chronic problem where people experience depression for a long period of time. So I think it's particularly true of depression, but obviously it's true of people with anxiety as well, and, and obviously anxiety and depression often go hand in hand. So a, a key thing is um, how, ge how services generally um, can help people to stay well, um, to manage their depression. So self-management is clearly an important issue, and, and, a, and a key question for, for me today, and also for the SHARP project that I'm going to tell you about, was about what role primary care could realistically have in that. So this is the, um, you probably can't see that very clearly, but just to give you a bit more information on this follow-up study I mentioned, um, so what we did is to follow up people, and we looked at the occurrence of relapse. By relapse, we define relapse as, on the PHQ-9 measure, or the GAD-7 measures, which is a, the measure of depression, measures of depression and anxiety, which are the key measures within IAP services. Um, we looked at whether people not only went from below the cutoff to above the cutoff, but also a, um, an increase in scores of at least five. So that was what was what, what's considered to be a clinically and reliable deterioration. So the bar was reasonably high in terms of defining people who had experienced a relapse. And, and um, what we found was that at six months, 40% of people had experienced a relapse, uh, over 50% at one year, and 66% within two years. Um, and another very significant finding was that for the people who had what are known as resi residual symptoms of depression, that's to say people who scored just below the cutoff, as opposed to well below the cutoff, were twice as likely to experience a relapse as those that um, scored much lower. So, and and that's, a, that's a fairly consistent finding. So I think what that tells us, in a, in a way, I don't think it's that surprising, because I think... I think it doesn't mean that the intervention wasn't helpful, but what it does mean is that it's the nature of mental health problems for a lot of people, that people will experience problems on an ongoing basis. And um, particularly with depression, I think people can experience it in the, in the longer term. And it's, to some extent, it's the nature of the problem for a lot of people and also people's lives. You know, some, a lot of people have difficult lives, don't they, with lots of stresses and lots of difficulties an ongoing difficulty, and it's not surprising in a way that that's the case. So 
I think as services we need to think, and, and I'm sure I don't need to tell GPs this because GPs in primary care deal with people on a, a long-term basis all the time, but I think you know, we need to step back and think about how we can help people in the longer term and help people to manage their difficulties, not just about a, you know, particular treatment episodes. So, I would say it's important to improve the long-term effectiveness of psychological therapies. And there is some work going on, and there are some interventions that have been found to increase long-term effectiveness, such as follow-up booster sessions, mindfulness-based CBT. There's quite good evidence for that now. Um, and obviously, antidepressants have a role there. The key question is, how can primary care services support self-help or self-management before and after therapy, and even for those who have recovered um, and what can primary care practitioners realistically do? And that really was part of the rationale for the SHARP project, which, as I say, began a long time ago, over 10 years ago, in the Wakefield locality. And um, we've we're recently um, updated the website, which is about to go live soon, so it's quite an opportune moment for me to talk about it now and about the resources that are available on the website. Well, one thing that, at the outset, we, a question that the primary care practitioners were asking us, because we were doing this very much in conjunction with primary care practitioners, and one of the key people who was involved in the SHARP project was uh, Stuart Lloyd, who's a GP in Nottingley. Um, I asked Stuart if he could come here to, to, to talk with me, but unfortunately he wasn't able to come, but Stuart was, was very much involved in this project. And the key question now was what self-help information can we reasonably recommend given how much there is out there um, and I, I, did, I recently did a, a search on Amazon for um, if you just search on Amazon for depression self-help I don't know if you can guess how many um, results you get but it's it's over 20,000 um, I, I recently I heard last year that there were something like um, 30,000 health, well-being and fitness apps available. Is it, can that be right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I was quite staggered by that. And so, but no, I think it's not unreasonable to say that some of the apps will at best be not helpful and at worst could actually be detrimental. So it is really important that we are guided. So I was, I was interested in what Alyssa had to say, and I think your work's really important to to help practitioners understand what actually they can recommend, what is actually good and what's not so good. I, I came across a, I've come across a few things that I think are worth mentioning. One, one is this website, readingwell.org.uk, which recommends self-help books and books generally that are considered to be good for health problems. Um, and they are supported by, or the, web, the Reading Well is supported by various professional bodies, uh, and by charities and has links to nice guidance, so I'd certainly recommend that. I, I, was, I was looking at what the health service is providing in terms of recommended apps. You, if you want to say something about this, feel free to. But this looks in development, this website, and it looks to me as though they're reviewing um, apps and um, presumably at some stage it will go live, but you can actually access this website and you can click on and you can find some of the apps and look and it does provide some information. So it's good that the, I think this is through NHS Choices, they are actually providing information to recommend health apps that they feel, they feel are, are helpful with some, if not evidence-based, at least some Sorry. positive recommendation. Yeah. They, they have to go through a process where they're um, measured against 240 questions. Right, so. okay, thanks. And another thing that I'd recommend is the, some of you will be aware of the self-help booklets from the, Northumberland Tyne and Weir NHS Foundation Trust. Um, you can download the leaflets, they're in different formats. They tend to be about 20 pages long, so they're not really, they call them leaflets, but I think they're more booklets rather than leaflets. Um, so, but, but they, they are pretty good, I would say, and uh, I would certainly recommend them. I think another thing to say is that we're talking about self-help support here. A really important thing is that, to bear in mind is that Self-help should not be a substitute for something more intensive if that's what a person needs. So it's, it's best provided in terms of stepped care. And I think most of you are familiar with the, the, the idea of stepped care. 
Um, and so self-help has its place. In a sense, we all, you know, we all do self-help, don't we? We all do our best to manage our lives the best way we can. So in a sense, it's a global, universal thing, the idea of self-help. The question is, what can we do as practitioners, as professionals, to help people to help themselves by providing useful information and useful support for people? So now we're going to talk about the Sharp um, project. Uh, we have a new website, which is about to go live. I was hoping it'd be live by today, but unfortunately, it isn't, um, there's a few glitches in it, as is always the case, and it should be live within the next couple of um, weeks. There was a previous version of the Sharp website, which was used a lot. Uh, we did Google Analytics on it a few years ago, and it was um, accessed a lot, um, so something like a 1,000 um, unique users per week. Most of them were nine, nine, sort of nine to five, so they were probably practitioners it was used quite a lot in primary care, but it was used a lot more actually outside of primary care, and I'll give you some information on that later. I've got a series of um, these sort of business cards, which I'll leave um, for lunchtime and um, break, so you can pick them up, you can, um, which has got the website name on it, and you can give them out to whoever you want, um, friends, family, colleagues, patients, whatever, um, just so people can have a look and see what's available. But there are a lot of what we consider to be good brief leaflets available on the website and I'll show you a few of them in a moment. I also, I mentioned Stuart Lloyd, I also want to acknowledge Mike Lawson who um, is, was formerly a CBT therapist working in the South Wales Yorkshire Trust. Mike is now retired but he was basically me, Stuart and Mike were the main people involved in developing the SMART project, the SHARP project with a lot of other people and the University of Huddersfield South West Yorkshire Partnership Trust Wakefield PCT, Primary Care Trust as it was, and the Yorkshire Strategic Health Authority all helped to support it. Okay. So, so key elements of the SHARP approach. It was, it was designed for primary care initially. The website is www.primarycare-selfhelp.co.uk. So it's, it's very much for primary care. And it was around what can realistically be done within 10 minutes, if, if, if 10 minutes is all practices have. It's still, you still only have 10 minutes, don't you? On average, is it? Yeah. Um, so the training focused on integrating resources into people's routine work. So it wasn't a case of saying, you know, go and do an extra clinic or, or whatever. It was, you know, within the time that you've got with your patients, what can you realistically do? How, how, you know, how these resources could be useful? Um, the, training, the leaflets in the training were based on CBT, Cognitive Behaviour Therapy, five areas model, and it incorporates links between physical and mental health. So I would say it's suitable for long-term health conditions, and this link between the physical and the mental health is something, obviously, that's sort of increasingly becoming important, so I think that, that there's um, certainly potential for it to benefit uh, there. It acknowledges that self-help is a normal ongoing activity, as I said before. So it's about helping people to do what they're trying to do anyway, to some extent. If you ask people with mental health difficulties what they're trying to do, people are trying their best to manage their difficulties. Sometimes they're doing things that aren't very helpful or detrimental. Sometimes they're doing things that are helpful, but it's a case of trying to help people to do that acknowledges the realities of a person's current life situation and stresses so that's really important because you know people often have difficult lives or are going through a very difficult time in their lives so it's really important that when the practitioner is talking to the person there's there's a a good acknowledgement of how things are for the person at that particular time and often it, and, and linked to that is the idea of normalizing the problem so you know, things like it's perhaps not surprising you're feeling the way you are at the moment given what's going on in your life, that, that kind of thing. It provides, potentially provides a structure for the consultation and that's certainly what the practitioners who did the training said to us and, and obviously an alternative to medication and in some cases we found it supported future referral and engagement in psychological intervention. So it provided sort of an early discussion about some issues and some socialise into the approach which and some encourage people to look at some of the self-help information 
which then meant that they were more informed when they were referred on for psychological therapy if that's what they needed and more likely to engage. We didn't sort of properly, I can't sort of prove that, but that's anecdotally what the practitioners were telling us. Okay, so that's the sharp, the new sharp website. Um, the leaflets, there's, uh, there's over 40 leaflets and there is potential to develop more. We've, um, now that we've got the new website, I'd like to develop um, some more leaflets. They're all only one or two pages long. So they were designed to be brief so that they were um, sort of bite-sized chunks of information that could be digested relatively easily um, and be discussed within a, a consultation, a short consultation. And we had both, re both um, full versions and more readable light versions. And we, had a, we got some funding for a health um, literacy person from the Wakefield PCT to uh, convert all the leaflets into more readable versions. It wasn't just a case of reading age. It was about the whole way in which they're, in which they're set out. Some of the leaflets were based on Chris Williams' books, Overcoming Depression and Overcoming Anxiety, which some of you may um, know about that. Um, and Chris Williams um, has popularised the idea of the five areas model. The five areas model goes back further than that, but Chris Williams' books are very much based on that, <clears throat> obviously with Chris's permission. So these are, these are some of the leaflets, just to give you an idea of some of the things that are covered. So... There were some on sort of getting started, a guide to using the leaflet to the f guide to the five areas model for anxiety, depression and stress. Um, understanding your problems, things like, you can see it's not just anxiety and depression, things like um, coping with trauma, coping with physical ill health, sleep problems, coping with grief and loss, chronic pain and so on. Some of the leaflets were written by sort of experts in the area, for example, the chronic pain one and uh, the depression during and after pregnancy. But as I say, they're all, they're all either one or two pages long and some more here. So some of the, leaf, some of the information there is about monitoring symptoms, so things like the PHQ-9, GAD-7, di diaries for people to use and leaflets on managing your problems so some strategies and uh, changing unhelpful thinking changing unhelpful behaviors and so on okay so that gives you an idea of some of the leaflets that were available as i said before the um the, the sharp approach the training and the leaflets were based on the five areas model which is popularized by chris williams as as, as i said before it goes back to um, sort of early stages of, of CBT, really. It's um, sometimes called the hot cross bun model within CBT circles. It's a very, very familiar approach. And it's a really useful framework for helping a person to understand their difficulties and to have a conversation with them about, therefore, what might help them, which is obviously the key thing. And probably the best way to describe it is um, by giving examples. But, but the five areas are, first of all, the outside world, a life situation, current stresses a person might be experiencing. So it's what's going on in the person's life, the outside world. And then the other four areas are more internal. So they're thoughts, images, more cognitive things, physical symptoms, behaviour and feelings and mood. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples just, just to illustrate how useful it is. So I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but we've got the five areas that there, and the two key areas on the, this one's called the vicious cycle that keeps depression going. The less you do, the worse you feel, the worse you feel, the less you do. I mean, that's, that's the classic pattern that you often find with depression, isn't it, where people who are depressed lose energy, enthusiasm, motivation to do things. And the less you do, the worse you feel. And the worse you feel, the less you do. It's, it's a very common vicious cycle. Behavioral activation is basically looks at that relationship. So the key relationship in terms of five areas here is between the feelings and the behavior. So it may well be if you're talking to someone with depression that that 
as you start to identify each of the five areas in relation to them, those two areas might come out and you might highlight those in the discussion, which could lead to, um, we've, we've actually got a leaflet that's called the vicious cycle, depression, the vicious cycle that keeps it going, which is a two page leaflet. There's another example which a lot of you will be familiar with, and that's the panic cycle. And the key relationships there in terms of the um, five areas are between physical symptoms, thinking, and feeling. So what typically happens if someone experiences a panic attack is they experience physical symptoms such as heart racing. They attribute that to a catastrophic thing like I'm having a heart attack, which obviously makes them feel more anxious. So as they feel more anxious, they get more physical symptoms, they get more physical symptoms, they think, oh my God, it really is happening, and they feel worse. So that's the vicious cycle between physical symptoms, thinking, and feelings that can lead to a panic attack. Um, you can also have dizziness with a person worried they're going to faint and so on. So there's diff different symptoms will give rise to different thoughts and different um, vicious cycle. But, but again, the five areas can help in a fairly short conversation for some people to actually highlight what's going on for them and again, there's um, certainly within Sharp, there's some leaflets. There's a leaflet available for, for looking at panic. And the final example is long-term condition, one for long-term conditions, because I thought that was um, worth looking at. So um, here we've got somebody who's experiencing chronic arthritis, um, unable to work, uh, living alone. So that's their outside world, what's going on in their life. And the effect it's having on them, the physical symptoms they're experiencing, pain, tiredness, and poor sleep. They're feeling low in mood, depressed, guilt and shame. Behaviour, they're tending to avoid people, not doing things that they previously enjoyed, previously against, got, gave them a sense of achievement. And there's lots of negative thinking, such as, I can't do anything, not the person I was, things won't get better. So it's not surprising that person's going to be feeling depressed. And again, there, I mean, there are, there are leaflets on chronic pain. Uh, there's leaflets on, um, on depression that might be appropriate. So, so what I would say is the approach that the, the leaflet isn't the only thing. The, the key thing is the conversation that's had to make sense of the difficulties and to give people a sense of understanding what's going on for them. The leaflet is something that can be given at the end of the consultation. Uh, but we, within the Sharp Project, we encourage the um, practitioners to ask the person to go away, to read something, try something out, and if necessary, come back. If they do need a referral clearly onto a specialist service, that, that, that might actually happen at that point as well. So we provided training to, uh, initially to primary care practitioners, and then it broadened out. And, and the training was really about it was over two half days with a follow-up half day. So again, we had to make the training very brief, which again was fitting in with the realities of primary care. And it was about gaining confidence to identify, acknowledge, and work with, uh, with patients' stress, anxiety, and depression. To identify appropriate structure, well, to have a sort of appropriate structure for the consultation, to help a person understand their problems and to sort of normalize it and to provide self-help materials and support to make use of those self-help materials. So that, that was it really. But we used lots of role plays and demonstrations and people went away, tried, looked at the resources, came back and discussed them and so on. So typically it was, as I say, two half days followed by it with a, with a follow-up half day. For those that wanted, not everyone came to the follow-up half day, I have to say, but for those that did, it was really useful a way of sort of consolidating what they'd learned and discussing it and sharing what they'd learned and so on. We then did a, the Strategic Health Authority then funded us to do Train the Trainers program. So we trained 50 practitioners to, who then went out and did further training. So it was cascaded, which I'll tell you about a bit later. I mentioned how Sharp can help to structure consultations. This is just a, a bit of a framework, I guess, really, thinking about what the key elements of the consultations were. This is based on feedback from the practitioners themselves. 
The key thing was, first of all, engagement. So things like listening, empathy, reflecting back to the patient, making links between thoughts, feelings, behaviour, physical symptoms and life situation using the five areas framework. So that whole area is obviously really important. And part of that is the normalising of problems that, you know, it's not surprising you're feeling the way you are given what's happening in your life to help people make sense of it and give them some ideas about, and some hope, because some people obviously come in feeling not very hopeful that things can change. You know, I don't think it does give people hope. And, um, and also, if there's time, ask them to what extent they can share or do share their problems and attempts to deal with them with friends and family, the whole social support side of things and attitudes to self-care. And just generally try and ask somebody to try something out, if only to read one or more of the leaflets and to come back. So the, so the training was initially provided to primary care practitioners in the Wakefield area, also health trainers. The health trainers actually loved it. They, they were really enthusiastic about it. Um, they, they, this is going back a bit, so I don't know if health, health trainers are still around, aren't they? I mean, the training for health trainers might have changed, but at that time, this is going back a few years, they, they were really keen on this because they felt they had kind of limited tools at their disposal, if you like, to, to use. Um, primary care, nursing, midwifery teams and substance misuse practitioners. So a key thing was you don't have to be a mental health professional. You don't have to be a trained in psychological therapy at all. This is for general practitioners in the general sense of the word within, within health healthcare. And potentially it could be used by other people working in the voluntary sector and so on. The Train the Trainers workshop, we trained 50 staff. Um, it was then cascaded. It was it, obviously inevitably some areas used it a lot more than others. Sheffield IAP service, for example, used it. They went out to the GP practices and they, they did short sessions at lunchtime where they introduced the sharp um, resources and so on and they got conversations going and they felt it helped to ensure more appropriate referrals were sent to IAPT. Uh, community midwifery and perinatal health service uh, there's just some quotes there training from the team it just some general positive feedback we got from there. The Sheffield Physical Health and Psychological Wellbeing IAP project that's a more recent thing I did a train the trainers workshop in Sheffield a couple of years ago for physical health practitioners who are qualified as IAP psychological wellbeing practitioners. So this is where their, their IAP service is geared towards both physical and mental health problems. So they're typically they're people with OT, physio backgrounds and so on. And they, they went and they were they were already using Sharp, I have to say, a lot of them and were had been using it for a lot of years. So we did the training, we looked at how they can cascade of training within different groups and for example they've provided training in musculoskeletal services burns and plastics department and a, um, a, a stroke team and I've also had feedback from outside the health service so that last quote there is from somebody who is a crew commander drive and training department for regional fire service because the website is out there anyone can access it not just professionals it's surprising how many people actually have found it. We probably need to do a bit of a, well, we will, when, we, when the new web website's ready, we'll do a, bit more, a lot more promotion and try and get, get it um, out there. So that, and uh, some of the practitioners that have probably stopped using it over the last few weeks, because we had to actually pull down the old, old website because it was, um, there were issues with it. We'll have, to, we'll have to sort of get them back using it again. I've got one other thing to talk about, and that's the SMART intervention. So I've talked about SHARP, this is SMART, self-management after therapy. I want to talk about the self, this was actually funded by research capability funding from the um, West Yorkshire research from the CCG. So th this is um, a more recent piece of work I've been involved in. Developing an intervention, a kind of relapse prevention intervention or a self-management support intervention to help people to stay well after therapy. So it di directly addresses that issue about people who might recover 
from a psychological intervention but then struggle to stay well and and the question is you know how can we help people to stay well after therapy it was also based on a bit of service user consultation we did in Barnsley a few years ago where um, we talked to people who had been through the IAP service just asking them what you know how, how things were for them now and one of the th one of the things that always sticks in my mind that one of the service users said was I know, I know what to do to stay well, but when I'm down, I just don't do it. And I think that's how it is for a lot of people, that they, they kind of know I should be doing things to stay well, but it's just really hard to, to actually do it, particularly when someone's feeling down. And so the question is, how can we help people with that? So what we thought was that we'd use an approach called implementation intentions, which is a well-recognised approach within health-related behaviour change. So, for example, there is good evidence that it has a positive effect on health-related behaviours such as doing more physical activity, quitting smoking, eating more fruit, that sort of thing. And we thought, well, perhaps we could apply this to self-management of depression. And within the idea of implementation intentions, it's quite a simple idea, but it bridges what's called the intention behaviour gap. So, we all have good intentions, don't we? But we don't necessarily put them into action. So that, you know, the New Year's resolution thing. And it's quite hard sometimes to put something into practice, even though you've, you've, the intention is there, but it's, it's actually doing it, that's the issue. So the idea of implementation intentions is that you have these if-then plans, which link a cue or a situation to a behavior, uh, which prompts the behavior. And the best way to illustrate it is to give you some examples. So an example of an implementation tension, or IMPS as they're sometimes called, would be every evening, which would be an external cue, then I will write down all my achievements for the day. So that's a very concrete, clear, if-then type of plan. Or if I arrive at work, this is one more to do with physical activity. If I arrive at work, then I will take the stairs to my office and not the lift. And the idea is that, you know, we might say, oh, I'll, you know, I'll, t I'll take the stairs more. But if you actually have a, the idea of implementation tension is that it's a very specific plan that's written down, discussed and agreed. So that the idea is that when you're in that situation, being in that situation will bring to mind the response. So you say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I should do this, or I should do that. And then there is evidence that it, it, does, it does help. Some of the cues can be internal. So if I feel down, then I will talk to my partner about how I feel and what may be causing it, which would be an external response. So the cue can be internal, external, and the response can be internal, external. Another one, if I don't feel like going for my daily walk, then I'll remind myself how much better I feel after I've been and do it anyway. So get the idea it's, a f it's it's not rocket science but it is something that has been found to work with health related behaviors as I say such as quitting smoking and things like quitting smoking if you think about it people are likely quite often quite ambivalent about cutting down smoking whilst you'd think with self management for depression people should be fairly positive about wanting wanting to achieve that goal and and I would say a good way to illustrate this point is if you just think for a moment of five things that you do on a regular basis that are important to your well-being they could be things that you do every day um, or every week or or less frequently than that but they are you know things that you do that are important to your well-being and then if you just think if I wasn't doing any of those five things how would I feel and that kind of gets the message across, I think, of what we're talking about here. Because people who are depressed often do stop doing the very things that help them to stay well and help them to feel good. So the idea of this, this, this intervention is to basically help people to continue to do the things that help them to stay well. So the actual intervention, called the SMART intervention, self-management after therapy, was provided by psychological wellbeing practitioners within IAPT service. So this is an intervention that's been designed for IAPT. And the question is, I guess, for today is partly, is it something that could be used in primary care? 
perhaps in a, in a different way. It involved a face-to-face -face meeting with the client within two or three weeks of the final session for up to an hour. So an hour face-to-face -face session to agree the plans, the imps, and, and then three telephone, half-hour telephone follow-up appointments. One, two to four weeks after the first one and then the others monthly. So it was, it was providing a bit of a bridge from the end of therapy to people managing and coping without therapy as well as helping people to stick to do the, to carry out their plans. Um, we, we did various things. Like we looked at the types of imps that people came up with and because we had no idea what they, and, and mo most of them were consistent with the model. So we, we did a sort of um, fidelity um, check to see whether they were consistent with the model. Most of them were. Uh, the ones that weren't tended to be p were when people had, um, weren't specific enough. So they might, they might have said, you know, at the weekend I will, which is not, is, is too general. And uh, we found that most, 40% involved internal cues, 60% external cues, so on. So we did a sort of analysis of the, the types of implementation intentions people identified. And we, we looked at the outcomes, but it was a fairly small group, and it was essentially a study that was looking at the development of an intervention, not the evaluation of the invent intervention, although we did look at outcomes. And the outcomes were encouraging, but by no means can we draw any conclusions from it because the numbers were so low. But we did interview, we did get feedback from the, um, the service users. And on the whole, people were very positive. First session was a nice bridge from therapy because I'd set the plans. It motivated me to do them. When I look back at the diary, I could see I'd come a long way, so on. The negatives were around too much paperwork um, they, they were required to fill in diaries as well as carry out the imps. Um, and one person said, my husband was not supportive, so I didn't tell him. And on the, on the, the, the opposite of that, we found that quite a few of the people did share their plans with partners or family members, and they said that that was extremely helpful to do that, so that the the partners or whatever were involved in actually identifying the plans and carrying out the plans. And there were some really nice examples of, now I've got this plan written down, we've talked about it, and when we always do this, and he or she'll remind me. And there were some really nice kind of examples of how the person's social network would be engaged in uh, self-management. So I think that's potentially a, a really important area. And within the literature, there is an idea of collaborative implementation intentions, which um, which fits with, with our experience. And for the, the psychological well-being practitioners who are providing the intervention, they, um, they were very positive about it. They said it's good, good to work with clients who were doing well, because most of the people they see obviously are, are struggling, but they were actually dealing mainly with people who were, who were okay and trying to help them to stay okay. And it fitted really well with their training and their way of working as well, which is why the training for the PWPs isn't, doesn't take very long. I'm, I'm about to do a training session in uh, Bradford next month. So what, what we're doing now is we're doing a, a further study in Barnsley uh, well, uh, and Cumbria IAP services, so we're gathering outcome data and, and doing more interviews. Um, there's an implementation in Bradford. We're doing a training session next month. Myself and three of the PWPs from Barnsley who have provided it are doing a, a day's training for the psychological wellbeing practitioners in uh, Bradford and My Wellbeing College. Uh, we're developing Smart Leaflet for the Sharp website. And I'll just finish with a question really as to whether primary care has a role in that, whether that's, that's an approach that can be used and supported within primary care. So I'd be interested to see what people have to say about that. And I'll just finish with a, a cartoon now. I don't know if you can read that, but um, I think it's something, it says something about self-help. So the doctor says, now you've recovered, Mrs. Smith. I have to tell you that all along you've been taking placebo medication 
Mrs. Smith said, well, doctor, I haven't been taking the tablets at all. Mm -hmm. She thinks quite good. And that's it. 